Do you credit the prison system for that recovery or do you credit the community that you found the through community. working hard in your teenage years to get there? Definitely the community. The, the prison system is shattered. It is absolutely so Do you think shattered. had you gone in, I mean, this, this is, I guess, a more of a commentary on the system as a whole. Do you think had you gone in with no taste of that community, with the upbringing that you'd had, you ever could have come back around to live a normal, fulfilled life? No chance. So the, the, and that's, you know, there's plenty of data to support that that wouldn't have been the case because you, you've only got to look at our reoffending re stats. So in this country, I think our, our reconviction rate is about 60%. And that's just so it's like a court. So 60% of those that walk out of those prison doors are going back to jail. Six, zero. Yeah. Wow. And that's just those that get caught. Do you have any comparisons in other countries that do it differently? The only, I think the only, Finland, we are. Finland are very open with theirs, so aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So Scandinavia as a whole do it really well. They focus on rehabilitation rather yeah. than punishment. Whereas in the West, I know we have, in terms of Western Europe, we have the highest prison rate per capita. Uh, whereas America are worse than us. Okay. But in terms of Western Europe, we are the worst. And that's because you go into prison and think if, think for example, you're a 40 year old man, you have a wife, you have kids. For whatever reason, you take in a different direction, struggling on bills, whatever, you decide to sm sell a, a small amount of classic drugs to your friends amongst your community, which regardless of your opinion on that, we're talking low scale, but we're talking class A drugs. You get arrested for that. You get six years in prison. Well, now you lose your job. The press have covered everything. So now your kids are getting harassed in school. Your wife can't handle the stress that she's getting from the kids getting harassed in school. You end up with a divorce. House gets sold. Kids don't want anything to do with you. You then spend your three years in prison. You come out to probation. You have no no sense of rehabilitation whatsoever. You come out, you can't get a job anywhere because you have to declare the fact you've been to jail for drugs. So nobody will give you a job. So you've lost your marriage, your kids, your job, your life as a whole. You can't get another job. What are you left with? Where do you go? You go straight back to what you know. And that is unfortunately the situation we're in where... It's a desperation cycle, isn't it? It is, yeah. What, what, what? Until you can provide an alternative, people are just going to go back to what they know best. And if you know that you can make ends meet by doing X, that's what you're going to do. Until someone provides you with Y, and, and that's, where, that's where our prison system falls apart because there is, there is no sense of education. There is no sense of purpose. You spend 23 and a half hours a day in a box with a stranger on a bunk bed watching daytime television. That is it. There is nothing else there whatsoever. And, and, that's, and that's sad because you meet some really, and don't get me wrong, I would say the majority of people that I met aren't people that I would really associate with after the fact. However, there are 20, 30% of people that you meet in there who are just good people who've made a bad decision. I think that's where the, the counter argument always is. And people have different opinions on the upbringing, the privilege, the background, the support that these people have had to, to have such opinions. But... The example you've just given, the counter argument, well, they made their choice, you reap what you sow. But if that's come from a place of desperation, that the person saying you reap what you sow can't comprehend through a better background or a different background, it, it, it's very difficult to really pinpoint what the solution or the alternative is other than some sort of upheaval on preventing people from finding themselves in desperate positions in the first place. Because if you're saying there's 20, 30% 30, 30 of people in there that you think we're good people that have made bad decisions. Everybody's made a bad decision in their life, but it's scale. And the scale of that will increase relative to the scale of the desperation in which their current circumstances dictate. So I'm not expecting you to have the answer, but in terms of from what you've seen with your experience and having the mind that you do to look at things through an analytical lens, what would be the changes that you would make to try and have an impact on this? We need to follow the Scandinavian model. So, so the... And the Justice Sec has said this many times, although it certainly isn't practiced, is that the punishment, when you're sentenced for a crime, the punishment is prison. Whilst you're in prison, you're not meant to be punished further. Your punishment is having your civil liberties removed. You're having your freedom removed. That is the punishment. Whilst you're in jail, the focus is meant to be rehabilitation, reform, prepare you for the world that comes next. So you can come out a better person and you can have opportunities. But in this country, we don't get that. You have the punishment for prison, then you punish whilst you're in prison, then you punish when you get out of prison. And that's the issue that we have. And it, it's difficult. I mean, even, and in fairness to government, even if they do the right thing in terms of reform and they give you opportunities and they ensure that there's work available when you come out of prison and there's accommodation, you still have the battle with the press. 
once your name is in the press, you can be Google forever. And it doesn't matter if the government have the best intentions, they can't force an employee, an employer to hire you who's not going to because they will just Google your name. And you can't really blame that on the corporation itself because if I have two candidates looking for a job or if any employer has two candidates looking for a job and they have identical CVs and one's been to jail and one hasn't, where's the incentive to go for the person that's been incarcerated? You're, you're an employer now. Yes. Have you had this come across your desk and had to make that decision? I have, and I have four ex-offenders on my payroll for the simple fact that they have evidence to me that they've applied for over 100 jobs and they've been declined from every single one because they've been transparent about their offense, albeit 10 years previous, and they can't get a job anywhere else. Is it, is it a crime to withhold that? Or is it just... You are obligated to declare. Okay, okay. It's It's changing somewhat. But if you get, say for example, if you get a sentence over four years, I think it is, your conviction remains unspent for life. So you have that for life. So it, it's only because of my understanding of that situation where I've seen lads who desperately want to do better and they have applied to absolutely everything they possibly can have been declined where I'm like, okay, well, I need to give this person an opportunity. Otherwise, they're never going to have one and they're just going to end up back where they are. Had I not had that personal experience in prison and seen how bad the system is, as an employer, I'd look at that and go, well, I'm taking the safe bet. Why wouldn't I? Do you still have to fight with any sort of bias? When you, If you had two CVs in front of you, would there be a part of you that you'd have to wrestle with just through societal conditioning? Or has your experience removed that bias? I'm the polar opposite in that. And I had, and they used me as the poster boy in prison at one point for employments after prison. So I did a speech for... Uh, Mark and James Timpson of Timpson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of Who are the one of the best best employers in the UK, aren't they? Yeah, they yeah. are indeed. For Timpsons, for Virgin, and for McDonald's. I done a presentation for them whilst I was in prison because, as I said, they used me as the the poster yeah. boy for reform, which is quite ironic because I think the system is absolutely broken to pieces. But that 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 then created opportunities for people to get work. So I, I was all for it. So I, you know, I did a talk for them and I said, look, I said. There are certainly bad apples. There's no argument there. There's some people that are going to be lifetime criminals and that's just how it is. I said, but you also have to see that most of these lads in here, because this was in a, we progressed through the system at that point, I was in an open prison, which is a little bit more relaxed. You you start in a, a higher category. So the, the, the highest security is a category A and the lowest is a category D and you work your way through the system. You get to a category D and it's an open jail. So there's no, no locks, no fences. It's all very relaxed it's on a trust basis. If you mess up, you'll get thrown straight back into the higher security. But this is where you have a, and this only represents maybe half a percent of the prison population. And there's there's about 100,000 people uh, in prison at the minute in the UK. Um, maybe, in fact, no, maybe a little bit more. Maybe, maybe, maybe 4,000 of that population is in an open prison, which is where you actually have an opportunity to do a little bit better. And that, that's kind of the, the Scandinavian model is very much open prisons. And that's why they do so well. Um, and I, and, and I said to these, these directors, I said, look, there's, there's lad, the lads here in this room who are looking for opportunities. I said, and this is, this is based on employment from prison. So you get to leave the prison in the morning, go to work, save some money up. The prison take 40% of your wages and they put that to like a victim fund. You keep 60% in your bank for when you get out. So you have a, a nest egg of sort. And then there's an employment opportunity when you leave. So with Timpsons, for example, if you go to a Timpsons key maker or a shoe yep. maker or Max Spielman, chances are, the person that you're that's saving you, there's a 50, 50 percent chance that they are on day release from prison. And if you work well in that environment and you save up a little bit of money, that when you're released, Timson will honor that and they'll give you that job after after you're released, which is brilliant. That's fantastic. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So that and, and they're the kind of big opportunities that that are out there, but they're few and far between. And I said, look, if you if you're going to hire somebody from within prison and give them an opportunity, I said, look, they're not taking sick days because if you take a sick day in prison when you're meant to be going to work, you get penalized. You get what's called an IEP. You get a couple of them and they're taking the television off you. You're taking your visits off you. They're taking you, you know, all of your privileges you get taken away. I said, so you can't, you can't take a sick day. I said, people are desperate for money because the average wage in, wage in prison is eight pounds per week. So you, you're on buttons and you've got to decide what you do with that eight pounds. Do you spend it on tobacco or vapes if you're a smoker? Do you spend that on phone credits? Do you spend that on food? Because the, the nutrition in prison is dire, absolutely dire. So you, you know, you have no daylight. So you get no vitamin D whatsoever. The nutrition is absolutely poor. You get no exercise whatsoever, no opportunities. And you're just watching cooking programs and reality TV and soaps all day long. So, you know, so you, you, you are, your mind is mush. 
Um, I say, so look, the, the, the opportunity to go out and work, I feel like you have purpose again. I said, you're going to find some of the most loyal workers you're ever going to find because these are people that are desperate for opportunities. And if you find the right people, and don't get me wrong, one in every 20 may burn you. They may be an idiot. But if you're going to gain 17, 18, 19, hardworking, ambitious, grateful employees, then then surely it's worth it. And, and surely, surely the... Surely the employee retention is significantly higher when you're giving someone an opportunity that they desperately need versus somebody who's just jumping from job A to job B to job C. It's just a different incentive structure, isn't it? it it's, it's, you can look at bonuses in one firm for people that don't have the same struggles, but an incentive structure for somebody that has nothing in that situation, just having the job is the incentive structure required. It's huge, but they, you know the, the government don't really want to touch it and they don't want the press that's associated to it if something goes wrong. And the mentality, the mentality in prison is unfortunate it's that when somebody messes something up they take it away from everyone which mm. is isn't a and i wrote a piece for the governor in one of the last prisons i was in and i said the, the mentality doesn't work at all i said it I said it's it's you know if somebody if they create a new incentive or a new opportunity for somebody and 100 people are doing it and one person messes up and they do something stupid they take that off 100 people i said uh, and that logic is kind of like if you apply that to driving offenses one person breaks the speed limit, we take cars off everybody. And that, that's the kind of mentality that you've got in prison. If one person abuses it, they'll take it off absolutely everybody. And that, that's that's backwards and that's not how we work in normal society. But because they're so concerned of the press that might follow, hmm. oh, criminal give an opportunity and those X, Y, and Z, and the, pre the press will gobble that up. So that, so it, it would need to find an answer, to find a solution to the, you know, the, 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 I'd say the embarrassing reoffending rate that we've got in this country, you would need an effort in unison between both government and press to change the entire outlook on not every person with a criminal record is scum of the earth. But, but also acknowledging that some people could not be rehabilitated. Yeah. Because they're not bad apples. And and that's and that's and do we tarnish everybody with the same brush or do we give people an opportunity because they paid their penance, their 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 crime. They were sentenced for their crime and their punishment was to be apart from their family and society for so many years and have everything else stripped from them, which you can say that's just, that's fine, but that is their punishment done. That's the end. On the flip side of that, we are meant to treat them people as if they are now, I mean, to err on the side of caution, but they are human beings and they've made a mistake and they've had a whole lot of time to think over their mistakes. Do we just then say, no, we're not going to give opportunities to the, to the millions of people in the country who've been to jail or do we say it's worth taking a chance and seeing who the ones are who really mess up just so that we can save the 16, 17, 18 out of the 20 that just want to go back to living a normal life and have an opportunity? Like if you, and as I said before, if you leave prison to absolutely nothing and there's no opportunities, you're just going to go back to prison. And what it would cost us, what it would cost the state to put measures in place to put people in opportunities would be significantly less than it costs us to house that many prisoners all over again by failing them same people. Mm. So it would be a cost-effective solution, yeah, similar to the similar similar to the angle we took on the pandemic of prevention is is more efficient and more cost-effective than cure. Locking people up and it costs on average, I think it's like forty to fifty thousand per prisoner per year to keep them inside. Obviously, that's taken into everything in consideration: staff, in food, energy. That is to have that much in resources. Say say only say only fifty percent of those people, or even less are willing to take them opportunities out the other side. Then you're talking 100,000 people at 40, 50 grand a pop. That's significant. You're telling me we can't allocate those resources into, into a better rehabilitation reform system similar to that what they do in, in Denmark and Finland and Sweden. And we'd be saving the country a fortune 